Hello YouTube, Jumpy23 here with the third part to my efficient Fire Emblem series that I wasn't sure I would make at all. Well, I've decided to. This is the third part, so I would recommend starting from my first video, A Case for Strictly Defining and Measuring Efficient Fire Emblem Play, which I'll link in the description. And as always, if you'd rather read the script than watch, I'll link that in the description as well. Fair warning, my Iron Man play is going to be even worse than usual in this video. Before I hop in, I also want to shout out Actual Lizard, who has just started a series playing through FE3 Book 1 with ETC as a benchmark. He's uploaded through Chapter 7 so far, and I'll link the first video of that in the description. It's a great example of applying the theory that I've been ranting about in practice, and it's quite entertaining. The biggest pushback that I received to adopting ETC was, Fuck off, I don't want to do math every time I discuss Fire Emblem. I feel you there, I don't either. However, I think that we get 90% of the benefit just by agreeing that ETC could be used to calculate efficiency, even if nobody ever actually calculates the ETC of anything. Allow me to lead in with an extended analogy. ETC is a measurement, like weight. We all agree on the units of measurement for weight, and how to measure the weight of something if we so wished. Yes. Americans have our own units, but we all agree on the conversion factors, so shush. But, how often do we actually need to weigh things in order to make decisions about weights? Given two things, we can generally tell which of them weighs more, unless it's close. If we want to reduce the weight of something, we know how to do it. I can even pick something up and probably tell you its weight to within 10% of the actual value. Yes, sometimes you have to whip out the scale, but Usually, intuition of what the scale would tell you is all you need. Similarly, having an intuition of ETC is usually all you need. Valcama pointed out the most important heuristic in the comments of my last video. If you have a reliable clear, ETC is roughly equal to turn count, and ETC punishes resets very heavily. Even a 50% reset on turn 1, or a 20% reset on turn 4, costs an entire turn. If you want to get a low ETC for a map, as quick as you can with a single digit chance of failure is usually the right answer. And chance of failure is the easiest possible reliability calculation, so it doesn't get much simpler than that. When we want to improve ETC, it's easy to grasp the important emergent properties of the formula without actually needing to run the numbers. Things like, use accurate weapons, especially on route maps, don't rely on crits or dodges, Prefer extensions to resets, only take risks on turn 1, and, yes, reduce turn count. If you have a clear that does all of these, then it's going to be quite efficient, and you can probably approximate ETC as turn count or turn count plus 1. Additionally, it's going to be, in my opinion, a fun way to clear the game, because ETC pushes you to make as many interesting tactical maneuvers as you can without resetting. Another aspect of the I don't want to do math argument seems to be the fear that rough ideas will be discarded entirely. In other words, that you can't spitball how a unit might work or talk about how you've played a map in the past unless you bring the numbers and the math to back it up. I'm absolutely not trying to wipe out this kind of discussion, which I do all of the time myself. However, a basic understanding of the principles of efficient play, as outlined in the previous paragraph, gives us a better framework to evaluate these kinds of arguments. But, when someone feels really strongly about something and really wants to prove that they are right, they have the ability to do so by busting out the abacus. Under the current loosey-goosey definition of efficiency, where clout and rhetoric are key, it's very difficult to change the status quo opinion except by being a big name YouTuber. Most of the time I personally bother to sit down and do real ETC math is when I'm attempting to do exactly that. But I'm very glad I do have this option when it comes up. The other question that I got asked over and over on my last two videos was, how does all of this relate to unit tier lists? To me, there's a lot more to efficient Fire Emblem discussion than just tier lists, but I understand why I kept getting that question. For a lot of people, the only time they hear the efficient buzzword is when discussing unit tiering, since tiering is such a big part of that semi-casual, semi-hardcore Fire Emblem space that, say, mecha viewers occupy. No offense is intended by the word casual, by the way. It's just a way to describe people who don't write YouTube scripts discussing efficient Fire Emblem. The assumption that 
tends to come up in these posts is that an ETC informed tier list Units are only judged on a single context, usually the most efficient known playthrough. In other words, there are two approaches to unit tier lists. One which sorts units by their contributions to some canonized route, and another that ranks units on how they could potentially help you. Sometimes LTCers do make lists of the former type after completing an LTC for fun. And people seem to be concerned that I envision the same thing applying to low ETC runs. I guess the assumption here is something like, while we didn't really have a metric for efficiency, and everything could be basically argued to be equal, you had to take all these different contexts into account. But if you can prove that context A is better than context B, you can completely disregard B. I've seen some other assumptions, like that an ETC tier list could not ignore recruitment costs or had to be played on a certain difficulty. For example, in the most efficient known contexts, Loot does literally nothing in FE8. <laughs> there are only four units for whom this is true. The others are the usual culprits, Marissa, Amelia, Ewan, if you're curious. So, if we adopt the canonized route methodology for an ETC-informed tier list, Loot would be a bottom four unit in FE8. But this is definitely not how I would run a unit tier list. The core purpose of unit tier lists is, in my opinion, to facilitate discussion of units. Specifically, I think that there are three questions to answer. What can this unit do? How good is this unit at doing this? And how central is this to beating the game? Narrowing context too much fails to answer these questions in a satisfactory way because you're considering only a small subset of answers to the first question. What can this unit do? The way that I phrase this in unit tier lists I've run is as follows. We consider all contexts in which a unit can be reasonably used, weighted by efficiency. A minor contribution that reliably costs no turns is valuable. A major contribution that only costs a few turns is valuable. A minor contribution that reliably costs only a few turns, or a major contribution that reliably costs a handful of turns, can be somewhat valuable. Slower strategies need proportionally greater impact or reliability to be worth heavily weighting. Yes, this ends up being subjective, but that's good enough for something as silly, fun, but still silly, as a unit tier list. I think this system produces fairly good results in practice. Returning to the loot example, when she is used, she has some unique upsides and replicates the upside of some other fairly decent units at the price of a slightly costlier training arc. The efficiency discords tier list for FE8 has loot well far away from the bottom, somewhere around other mid-filler units like Garcia and some units with unique but few contributions like Colm, which feels about right to me. An interesting positive application of ETC to tier list comes in the realm of unique contributions. Unique contributions, things that can only be done by a specific unit, are generally given more weight in a tier list. With a vague understanding of efficiency, it can be very difficult to actually have unique contributions, but ETC can crystallize being the best at something into something meaningful. To give a real example from a few days ago, the efficiency discord was debating Panette's tiering and discussing her wrath vantage performance on route maps. Technically, this can be replicated by Kagetsu, with 10 less crit, which would make it not a unique contribution. However, Doing some quick napkin math, we saw that Kagetsu has a significant chance of death on a late turn, thanks to his non-100% crit chance, which meant that Panette saved multiple ETC turns and this was a unique contribution. Just to illustrate the ease of using ETC intuition, I'll show the napkin math that we did. We spitballed 10 do or die 90% crits over the course of a 6 turn clear if you're using Kagetsu. 0.9 to the 10th is a 0.35 chance of success, so that's a 65% chance of failure. Amortize that to turn 4, and you get 7.4 turns of reset penalty with Kagetsu. It took almost exactly as long to say this paragraph as it took to actually do the math during the conversation. And no, this isn't the exact number, but it's clearly high enough to prove that Panette is uniquely good at Vantage Wrath setups. This example is for high tier units, but the logic applies for lower tier units as well, and I could give several examples. Joshua can double Kellogg reliably. Shima is your most accurate Parthia user, or Benny's fierce mean increases hit rates. 
Compared to my last two videos, I'm not sure that there is much of a conclusion to be had here. This was more of an exploration of the ways my proposed definition of efficiency can affect Fire Emblem discussion, but I hope some of them sounded like interesting applications to you. Thanks for watching.